Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Two times through. When you look up the verses, it's like I say, well, what else could it mean? It, it can't mean anything else. I mean, and if you try to make it mean something else, you've got to be, you've got to be, really be stretching. So I say it's it's pretty conclusive that I could see where it's, it's, it's as obvious as the nose on my face. And that is, where does the 144,000 in Revelation come from? How do we get 144,000 from the 12 tribes that are, uh, I know this isn't the lesson, but it, I think it's worth talking. And it, what's this, not Mike Harder, Harder, what's his Robert name? Robert Breaker. Robert who? Breaker. Breaker said this. You know, wherever you get the information from, where do you hear where you get the information from? He, he said the 144,000, now he says it's not foolproof, but there's a chance that it's when they slaughtered the infants that were two years and all the males, two years and younger. Oh, yeah. Have you heard this theology? And a theory. Just a theory. Oh, oh, I know. Just an opinion. Well, I think it's a pretty strong one. You so were just saying it's a pretty strong opinion. And I might you didn't use the word strong. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty conclusive. Is uh, and then it, it cross references um, two uh, Matthew two. Go to Matthew two seventeen and eighteen. Let's do both verses right away. Uh, they quote this Matthew two. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Oh, by the way, why are they two years old and younger? Why not just the infants? And you can call a two-year-old an infant. You know, I still call, if, if you're 16 years old and you're my grandson, I still call you baby. Say baby. Because they learned about it two years after Jesus was born. Okay. So yeah, you can't go 
So when he uh, when they ran away, they run away. The idea is that they did they did those wise men, Mary and Joseph were in the in the stall and and the baby was in a manger. When the wise men arrived, how much later is that? Two years. Two years. Now you, you see you're not taught taught that other than in a fundamental church. I, I, I can't think of any other place I've ever heard that. It, it is so lack of uh, depth to it that they, it's two years and older. So when he, they meet Jesus, Jesus is a little boy. He's a two-year-old. Now we haven't gone over this uh, lately, but my assumption is you already know this. But you see, it's kind of like school. We, we learn we learn algebra in school, but we had to be retaught, retaught, and retaught. And so we we hear it, but we may forget it. Anyway, they're two years and younger at that time at Matthew two, and they meet. They probably meet at a house. Now, when they and they bring the gold, frankincense, and the myrrh. How many wise men are there? No one knows. Why is it the assumption it's three? Because of the. Gifts. The three gifts. All right. Uh, and by the way, how, 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 in Song of Solomon, how big is the, uh, I, I think it's the frankincense, it could be the myrrh. How big is the myrrh in Song of Solomon? Well, how, how, what's it described as? A pile, a mountain, what is it? I think it's called a hill. A hill of frankincense, or a hill of myrrh. It's called a hill. It's, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a mountain, but it's, it's a precious thing. And I think it's called a hill. Anyway, as they're heading in, Herod is heading in, Mary and Joseph are heading out. And, and why did they get the gold, frankincense, and myrrh? What was the purpose of that? Uh, they, well, you know, to display he was a king and he was a prophet. You know, they go on the, these explanations. God is very practical. Pardon? To sustain them through Egypt. They needed cash money. They needed cash to sustain them until Herod, was, the one that sought his life, was dead. And so then Jesus comes back later as a, as a younger, uh, as a young boy, obviously older than two, and so on. So anyway, if we go to, if we go to Matthew, Chapter 3, the 144,000 are virgins and are all male. Now, obviously, what is being killed here are all male. They're two years and younger, and obviously, the virgins. So we could clear up how do they get uh, uh, these virgin preachers. We could clear it up that they're already virgins when they're killed. All right, so if we're... Uh, Uh, verse 17 and then 18. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard in lamentation and weeping, great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. Uh, yeah, Where does it say to the coast? Or does it say that? Uh, it says that in verse 16. Go to 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So when we look at the verse, it says, and, and the coast. So Bethlehem is not on the coast. So he goes from Bethlehem all the way to the coast. I would assume to the Mediterranean. He kills all those kids. Now I've seen these these Jesus films when they do that. They look and say, "Well, they really only killed about twenty or forty kids." I, I've heard this stuff where they didn't kill too many. Well, according to verse sixteen, they killed all, all the way from Bethlehem all the way to the coast. That's what that's what it, the way I read it. And then if you look at how it's, the land is divided, it's divided into strips when the map is given because the, the, how the land is divided it goes from there all the way to the coast. So every tribe does that. They go to the coast. So that's a, that's a lot of kids. 
Then, then uh, the, the other thing is, that, well then how, why is it exactly this number? Shouldn't it be, it, it says, let's say in the Bible it says 360,000. Let's say that's the number given. Well, my God can count. You know, where the uh, theologians say, well, that's just an estimate. It was, it, God can count, and he can come up with the exact number. And so if God wanted 12,000 from each tribe, from Bethlehem all the way to the coast, he can count. And, 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 that, and that, could, that could happen. Now, if you go back to Jeremiah, go back there to Jeremiah 31, verses 15, I, I think that's what we want. Verse 15, thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. So they're, they're killed. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping. All right, don't cry in thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. So in other words, they're going to come back. So they're going to come back as the 144. I assume that's what he's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. He's coming back as the 144,000. So what, what, how do we know this? Uh, take Job as an example. How many children did Job have? have? How many children did Job have? Seven. No? He had ten. But his reward was double, right? So how many children did he have? Thirty. Well, two times. Two times ten. Plus the dead ones. He had ten. Plus, uh, two times, if, if he's doubled his reward, he has twenty. Well, it says that he has an additional ten children after he's restored. So if his reward is doubled, then where are the other 10? The first 10 that were all killed. They're in heaven and they're still what? Living. They're not dead. You see, it, it teaches that there's eternity here. These people don't die. So those children are gonna come back. I don't know, it seems to me, that sounds really conclusive. And after it's pointed out, does it seem really simple? I, to me, it sounds simple and it's so obvious. Why, and every time somebody points that out to me, something like that, I say, why didn't I see that? Oh, that just bugs me. It just bugs me as to why did I see that? That just, that just bugs me every time I, I, somebody does that. But somebody pointed it out that they're going to come again. That's where the 144,000 come. So is it is it proof positive? No, but is it it got a strong leaning towards that? Uh, pretty much got a strong leaning towards that. There's no filler in the word of God. It's hundred percent pure. It's hundred percent pure. No, no filler. No filler. Well, what we know for sure is they're coming again. That oh, we do know that those children. Right it says that those children are coming again. Yeah, they're coming again. All right, let's get back to the lesson. How were the books of the New Testament written? So let's, uh, uh, it has 27 books. Let's just start here, John 14, verse 26. But I thought, well, let's, let's bring that up right away, that thing that was, I don't know if you brought that up to me during Sunday school or did or was that? Okay, you just you just brought it up. That's that's pretty a pretty neat theology. All right, all right. Introduction to the New Testament. Uh, John fourteen verse twenty six. Uh, but the Comforter, <coughs> which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, he's, he's certainly not speaking to you and I. He's speaking to, to those that are in this chapter here and to his disciples. And, and they would become part of this 
the writing of the New Testament, the Holy Ghost is the one that brings to remembrance and inspires us. John 16, verses 14 and 15. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. What did I say? 1450. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. He'll show, show it to you. <coughs> and what, by, by the way, what does the Holy Spirit, uh, what is the function, the main function of the Holy Spirit? Anybody know what that is? That's found in these, this text. Maybe in these three or four or five, five verses there. What is the Holy Spirit to, to do? Who, to exalt Jesus. So whenever you see uh, recorded the Father and the Son, and it's the Father and the Son, and, it's, and it seems as though there's no Holy Spirit. So uh, we were, uh, when we were at the Presbyterian Church, uh, it, I, I remember I interrupted one, I was the new kid on the block, and they said, uh, and this was some kind of a meeting. I would go to those meetings. They didn't want me at the meeting. And I didn't know, and I knew Diddley Squad. I didn't know anything. And I'd come to these meetings because I wanted to know what's going on at the elders meeting. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to hear this stuff. And they, they said, well, well, we'll pray in the, in the name of the Father and, and the Son. And I said, well, isn't that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And, the, and then the pastor, who was the associate pastor, interrupted and he said, well, no, there are some people here that, that don't believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Now, it, I, I didn't have false teeth, but man, if I did, I may have inhaled that and choked on <laughs> it. Is that shocking? Is that shocking? That's very shocking. I mean, and if I, was ang I wasn't angry, I, I would have flipped a, a toupee it, it, you, or fried an egg on my head. It was like, I, I can't, I can't, but uh, folks, we're not alone in, in this. There, there are, uh, are w w this is going back 50 years. So this kind of stuff has been going on a long, long time. Now, where has this regressed to today? It's getting, it's getting darker, and evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Is it the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Isn't that what it says, Matthew 28? Right, verses 19, 20, in there, at the end? So, what is the answer to when it says Father and Son? Father and, and, and God the Father and the, and the Son. Father and Son. Father and Son. Father and Son. Well, the Holy Spirit is not pointing to Himself. He's pointing to the Father and the Son. He's exalting that. He's not exalting Himself. So when you go to one of those those kind of churches, and they're they're who are they exalting when they do all that tonguing? Themselves. Well, other than themselves, who are they trying to exalt? The Holy Ghost, and that is not one of the functions of the Holy Ghost. He does not exalt himself. So you can pick out false, you can pick out false brethren. You can pick out wolves and thieves, and and the rest of it by just some simple little verses like that. They've got a bird for a mascot. And they got a bird for a mascot. Yeah. Well, every time I see a dove, I think of the Holy Ghost, right? So. Uh, uh, all right, verse 13, uh, John 16, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things. Verse 14, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The, the, the thrust of the Holy Spirit is not to speak of himself, but to glorify Christ. And now these are just simple, simple truths. That it now it isn't it, it isn't just a little bit of that. It's a whole lot of that. It's, it's we need to obey what it says. All right, First Thessalonians two. First Thessalonians two. 
By the way, if you were going over there tonight, let, let's say you're going over there tonight, and you went from this, this kind of ground to more firm ground, let's say you were going over there, I would call him ahead of time and, and ask permission and, and see what he says. He may just say flat out no, or he may say bring it over and present it to me and let's see what happens. But if he could grant you five minutes uh, before his sermon starts, that would be a big, that I would call that a big deal. And then go up there, there's a box of rubber stamps. Take it up there with you. Pick out 10 of them and take it up there. By the way, did we mail them stuff? We mailed that over there and gave them a bunch. I'm pretty sure we did that, of rubber stamps and sent that. They sent us a thank you note and, and so on, but we didn't send signs. That was too bulky to send. All right, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You received it as the word of God and not as the word of men. So whenever you hear uh, so-called the word of God being quoted elsewhere, it, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. The minute I hear something other than the King James Bible being quoted, I just, I, I can't wait to get to the door. I, I just can't when I hear that. Or change the station, it just, it just, yeah. It, it just is. is the word of God, and you can tell the difference between the word of God and the word of men. Where they change these words around. And it's, it's not open to any private interpretation when they do that. You open it up to private interpretation when you do that. Hebrews chapter 1. Right here at the beginning. Paul, prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, and Philemon, our dearly beloved, and oh, see, I'm sorry, I'm in Philemon. God, who at sundry times, what does sundry times mean? Various, right? A various times, various times, and in diverse manners, in different manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So when the prophets spoke of in old, they, uh, they were permitted, uh, given revelation, and they uh, would speak of Christ, and, and, and not even knowing. They just wrote it down. But in, in different times, and in different manners, and in times past. So that's how it came to be, 1 Corinthians 2. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. All right, the spirit of the world can't know this book, but we've been given the spirit of God so that we can know it and recognize it and see it. The spirit of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. How does Ruckman interpret that verse? The traditional, the traditional teaching of those verses is what is perfect is coming. That's the question. What, what is coming that is perfect? Pardon? The KJV. the KJV. They say it's the Bible. That's the traditional teaching. And by the way, it's purified seven times. Where do you find that? It's purified seven times. It might be in our list. Pardon? Psalms, Psalms what? I want to say Psalms 12. But it's in, it's in Psalms. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's coming up here in our... And it is not. We'll, we'll find that. Anyway, uh, now Ruckman says this, that uh, that which is perfect is come, 
then that which is in part shall be done away. So in part, I would assume he means in part is uh, that those that are uh, writing the Bible, that has been done away because now we have the full revelation and we, we don't need to add anything more to it. Ruckman says that which is perfect is come, meaning Jesus Christ. And so his answer to that about the other doctrine, he said, we don't make false doctrine to try to disprove other false doctrine. Because you don't invent false doctrine to disprove false doctrine. You have to go get his commentary on Hebrews to find out exactly what he's talking about there. So uh, we could use that verse, but we don't have to necessarily use that verse. But uh, well, Second Timothy, can I say something? go go for it. It wasn't until the production of the King James Bible that you had both New and Old Testaments in the same volume. Yeah. So you did, now you have ready comparison. Yeah. So that's perfect. Oh, and today, now. today they want to make it that. Today's people are so much smarter than people of years gone by. Oh my goodness. By the way, just just for fun, how does electricity work? Very carefully. <laughs> Very careful. How does it work? Put the switch on and put the switch off. <laughs> I don't think they know. I think we learned in school, they have no idea how it works. It's like water though. When you push on the pipe here, when you push on the pipe, it's, it, it is compressible, but let's call it, we, call, we always went to the some incompressible flow. When you, if, if the pipe is a mile long, when you push on the pipe here, immediately the water flows out the other end. If you can't compress it, it's like moving a solid. So when you push it, it goes. Now air doesn't do that, it's you can compress it and, and, and build its pressure up. But why do you don't do that? But once you push, they say the same thing about electricity, is they, they have no idea how those electrons get from here to there. Or, well, they, they don't know. They, they have to get, they guess at this stuff. They don't know, they don't know what light is. They have no idea what this stuff is. But they do know this, they know it works. <laughs> they know it works, but they don't know why. Now, why did I say that? I said that for a reason. And right now I can't tell you why I said that. All right. Because you said we were talking about people today think they're so smart. Oh, that they're so smart. They're so, there, there are things they can't figure out. Why does light bend? You know the joke, you're so dense, light bends towards you. Light bends towards density. It, it, it bends, it can bend around things, it, things that are dense. Well, folks, they were smart back then. Yeah, I do preach a, a message that if you had to build one thing, just one thing, to get out of hell, you couldn't make it. Just one thing. Let's say to make this sheet of paper and type that on there. How to make a paper mill? Where do you get the paper from? How do you get the mill? Where do you get the steel from? How is steel made? If you from scratch, everything from scratch. You, trust me, you're going to burn in hell forever. <laughs> you couldn't make it. And you can't go to the store and buy it. You can't cheat. <laughs> it, it's just it's amazing. It's just amazing. Anyway, verse 16 and 17. Second Timothy will quit here. All scripture. Not some scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable. And for the very first thing that is profitable for is what uh, openly, there are some preachers that uh, one guy had said, well, we don't bring up doctrine here because it, it creates a big, it creates a couple, an argument. The very first thing is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. In the New Bibles, what is truly? Thoroughly. Thoroughly in the New Bibles. Uh, Once a specific um, publisher, I can't think of who it is. Pardon? I think, you're, I think you're right. It's Nelson's. 
in Nelson. In that publisher, it's changed. And so, uh, if you want to wink at that one, but it's Thruly. Well, I have Nelson Bio, and it does say Thruly in the King James. It says Thruly. All right, there's other Nelson that says th Thruly. Probably in the New King James. Okay, Thruly. It's Thruly. Thruly is a stronger word. Thruly is 100%. Thoroughly is like 95%. That's 90, yeah, right. it's, it's a, a stronger yeah, word. Uh, we give another example of a word, uh, and I can't think of where it is. It's a very easy verse. It's, I, I've been out of practice. I've been out of practice. We would use that word, and it, the, the word that's in the King James is more uh, uh, authoritative. Authoritative. It, uh, it 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 says all uh, at all times in all different ways, and I can't think of the word. All, all, instead of always, always, all way, without the S means all, always, in every different way, at any different time. It, it just, it's a stronger word. It's a stronger word. All right? Um, it's completely. It means completely. Wash me completely of all my sins. Sounds, uh, and it says truly. It's in the new King James. All right, now we are going to pick this up here next week and go through an introduction to the New Testament before we get into Matthew. Father, bless now the preaching in Christ's name.